let's talk about the 70s. Did you think I meant 1970s? Well, that's what the Millennium Bug was all about. The apocalypse where the world almost ended because the few digits were missing. The year consists of four digits, but the first few don't change often, so why bother using them, especially if you are on an early machine where each byte of data takes up valuable space and costs a lot of money. So it seems reasonable to just keep track of last two digits and ignore the rest. Even on my ID you'll see two different dates from different millennia, but you know exactly which one is which. We are human, but but the early computers are not. They don't assume. They need to know. So what happens when a computer suddenly runs out of numbers to represent the date? What would happen after year 1999? After 99 that'd be double zero. So how should we interpret that? 1900? 2000? 1900? Basically, in computers' minds, they would travel back in time, which means that tons of records they already have would be from the future. Imagine the chaos. Banking systems that rely on accurate dates suddenly think 100 years have been vanished. Loan payments, billing systems could suddenly reset or even shut down. Airlines that depend on precise scheduling data could experience massive delays or even cancellations. From power grids to government records, nearly every system was at risk of crashing. The world was relying on technology that had never been tested against the new millennia. In popular culture, this digital apocalypse is often portrayed as just another example of crowd alarmism, because, well, in the end, nothing happened. The year 2000 came and everything was alright. Crucial systems didn't shut down. A couple of funny moments and that's it. And yet, there were images of people withdrawing money from banks, buying tons of supplies, especially toilet paper. They always buy toilet paper. I'm sure some people even got stuck in their private bunkers with shelves full of napkins. But the reality is, it wasn't a false alarm it was an effective alarm, maybe even a bit too effective. The first one to address the issue was Bob Bemmer, an IBM engineer back in 1958. He was uh, mostly ignored. The apocalypse was still like 42 years away. Who would use such an outdated technology four decades later? Well, most companies did. See, non-IT companies are often slow and conservative when it comes to replacing hardware and updating software. Why fix something that's not broken? Why spend money training employees again and again? And so by 1990s most crucial software was already decades old. By the mid-90s everyone started talking about it, especially the news. The 90s were around the time when what we now call fake news began to take shape. And the headline was huge – the world would end with the new millennium. And it worked. People were genuinely scared. As a result, companies had to react. Interestingly, the alarmists were right. It was an issue. Everyone listened. Then they acted and it was avoided. But they might have overreacted. The estimated spending on updating software and hardware worldwide varies between 300 billion and 500 billion. This example always comes to my mind when discussing controversial issues, like, say, climate change. It turns out when we face a real threat, we can come together. We can allocate funds and avoid it completely. And don't get me wrong, at that time the question was highly politicized. The Y2K bill was heavily criticized and the media was raging on both sides. And yet we did it. Probably overspent a lot, but we did it. The healthy discourse shouldn't be about whether we should react or ignore the issue completely, but about what the right way to react is. What is the right amount of money and effort we should spend and where should we allocate resources? Many silent world endings have already been quietly avoided, especially in biology and medicine, and the main thing that always stands in the way is polarized politics. 